Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, forces, and faces of the Warhammer 40k setting. The grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. We also have channels for mythology and natural history. Links in the description. And we now have super thanks, so like, subscribe, and throw me a coin if you enjoy the video more than usual. Or patron, of course, but it's a long-term commitment. Now, let us proceed. The Bugs. The Great Devourer. The Swarms. The Hive Fleets. All designations they go by. But to the majority of the sentient life in the galaxy, they are known as the Tyranids. And that was simply due to it being the name of the first planet they were recorded to have sucked dry. But there is a singular similarity in all of these names. For they seem so imposing, so dark. Yet they are the opposite of this. For they are category slurs, diminishing terms for a race that none understand and none seem able to permanently defeat. Don't believe me? Let's have a think. Bugs. What does one do to bugs? We gas them, we burn them, or even step on them. The Great Devourer, symbolizing gluttony. And that has never been intimidating. So again, it is a backhanded reduction. The swarms, the high fleets, Again, dispassionate designations that defy needing to give them a more accurate name, a more personal touch. It is almost as if the entirety of the galaxy is taking them lightly. Like they, the Eldar, Orc, Tau, Kin, and even the Imperium, can practically ignore them while they play their Game of Thrones on a galactic scale. And, to be honest, this is the Tyranid's greatest strength, their most potent weapon is always the populations they will attack. For that is why they are here in the first place, no? To merely head off after our largest glistening globe of life-drenched biomass. They arrive, they swarm, they destroy, and then they consume. Right. They're just mindless bugs. Cockroaches with ships and an appetite. Right. And it is this perspective that has allowed them to positively thrive in their new home, the Milky Way Galaxy. For they are the only beings that have come from outside of the known galaxy, or so it is believed. Some say they are drawn here from the explosion of the Pharos Beacon during the Horus Heresy, like intergalactic moths drawn to a flame. Some say they follow the light of the Astronomicon, Yet according to even the most potent navigators, there is only such a radius to the light the Emperor projects. It only goes out so far. So how have they seen this beacon across the galaxies, if this is the case? Where a fully trained and soul-forged psyker or a potent navigator could not? Strange indeedy. Yet again, they are underestimated. They are brought down to a threat of a very large insect, termite, or even ant. Thus do the galactic powers, and all of the races that constitute their many levels of power, frame them in a way that makes them lesser. Like a mirror to a vampire, the races of the setting simply refuse to truly see the depth of their predicament. They refuse to see, or to even look, at what is there. For in the constantly updating realm of Warhammer lore, these beings are not just mindless killing machines. They are held together by one consciousness, if that is even the right word. Perhaps it is more a racial will, a specific subconscious that guides and controls the many tendrils of the hive, and is the umbrella above all of the fleets. For when one looks at the Tyranid in such a disparaging way, bringing them down to a level of mindless drones, then one cannot truly predict them, counter them, or defeat them. Because they are not given their due. Even orcs are monitored or watched by other races, be it by scrying, scouting, or capturing important orcs, assassinating those identified as their leadership, 
as the Imperium and the Elder are known to do. The other races thus give them agency. They do not think highly of the Greenskin at all. Nothing could be further from the truth, but they do still consider their attacks. And in this, they admit subconsciously that they deem the enemy a potential threat. But the bugs, the ones you can step on, as is so often true, the secret of opinion, the truth of the matter, is given in the name. But what if the Tyranids are not as mindless as others believe? What if this is an attack that was planned to the nth degree, by minds immeasurably superior to our own? <laughs> and the evidence is there. Oh, yes it is. But before I point out the factors, let us see if you can put them together yourself. I should do what I am known to do. I will read out the law blank scan to make sure it is contemporary and authentic. Then we shall discuss how it all comes out in those texts. If one takes a tiny step back. If one takes a threat and the species seriously. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote High Fleet Gorgon. No other High Fleet has been documented to possess the swift and insidious adaptability of High Fleet Gorgon. Its broods have been observed to hyperadapt even between one attack wave and the next, outwitting and outpacing even the most strategically flexible prey to their eventual hideous doom. It is the Tau Empire more than humanity's Imperium that has borne the brunt of High Fleet Gorgon's onslaught, possibly for as long as several centuries. However, humanity has been unfortunate enough to face Gorgon in battle, as have the Greenskins, the Eldari, and countless other alien races. Two common factors have emerged from these ongoing battles along the eastern fringe of the galaxy. The first is the speed and ingenuity with which High Fleet Gorgon has been seen to adapt in the face of resistant prey. The second, a more horrific observation, is the degree to which this adaptability favors toxic warfare. High Fleet Gorgon makes great use of weaponized spores, specifically those variants that billow in microscopic clouds or can be launched from bestial sporecaster organisms. The swarms of High Fleet Gorgon advance wreathed in rolling clouds of these devastating toxic spores. No rebreather or sealed compartment seems able to keep them out and even a single lungful can see victims' organs bloat and burst, with self-replicating organisms, even as their flesh slews from their bones. Sinister broods of venomthropes drift amongst the murk, tentacles whipping out to lash and strangle. They pump out ever more deadly gene pollutants to screen the tyranids' advance and choke the life from the foe. Toxicrines and malanthropes lumber behind them, have seen primordial terrors that surge from the veil of spores with lesser beasts scuttling around them to crush and trample resistant prey. Every organism in the High Fleet has within its body a toxin gland that contains semi-sentient spores. As battle progresses and more of High Fleet Gorgon's beasts taste the flesh of their foe, so these spores tailor themselves to the biological makeup of their prey. For each new fragment of gene data, a new effective adaption is transmitted through the synaptic network. Soon enough, the weapon spores of Gorgon become biological anathema to the prey organisms they are fighting, rendering even the slightest scratch or skin contact utterly lethal. Should battle rage long enough for this to be the case, the foe will surely be overwhelmed. Their armies melting away, often literally, in the face of the Tyranids' gruesome biological warfare. Such tactics have been observed not only to outpace and overcome the rapid technological advancement of the Tau, but even the Plague Hulk Vomnivorax, where they even undid the warp-saturated resilience of diseased Plague Marines. Most recently, as it pushes into systems claimed by the Imperium, High Fleet Gorgon has been seen striking at Agri-Worlds, 
If initial inquisitorial assessments of disasters, such as that of the Pagrius taint, are correct, the resultant spore-tainted foodstuffs may have already been circulated far and wide through neighboring imperial systems with nightmarish results. Highfleet Jormungandr Highfleet Jormungandr, sometimes referred to simply as the Great Serpent, hunts in a most unusual fashion. Favoring subterranean movements and sudden, shocking assaults, it stays out of sight and keeps its prey guessing. Many are the armed hosts that believed High Fleet Jormungandr defeated shortly before they were swallowed up from below. From the first, an assault by High Fleet Jormungandr is atypical for the Tyranid menace. Rather than surging toward their prey worlds, its hive ships hang back in the void and employ sinewy dorsal organisms to hurl chunks of space debris at them. Believing this to be an attempt at conventional bombardment, prey species do all they can to intercept and blast apart the incoming projectiles. Yet only rarely do they realize their true danger. For each projectile carries within it a living payload more deadly than any asteroidal impact. Even blasted into fragments, the chunks of debris strike down on trails of fire through the prey world's atmosphere. Within, Cocooned in heat-resistant sheaths of living matter, like broods of ravenous warlocks and trigons. Each fragment that makes planetfall disgorges its deadly passengers to burrow deep into the planet's bedrock and begin their campaign of terror. Once High Fleet Jormungandr has successfully infested a world, its organisms do all they can to rapidly increase their numbers. Slithering abominations the size of battle tanks churn through the depths beneath the feet of their unsuspecting targets. Perhaps the prey receive some disquieting hints of the threat growing beneath their feet, outlying mine complexes suddenly falling silent, tectonic monitoring stations detecting strange spikes in deep strata activity, catacomb complexes and deep dug armories vanishing into mysterious chasms. Yet it is rare, indeed, that the prey will grasp their true peril, especially while fully engaged defending against ongoing attacks from the hive ships on high. Then come the subterranean swarms as the Great Serpent strikes. Tunneling horrors explode from the depths to devour entire garrisons. Swarms burst from hidden tunnels like insect from a kicked hive. Towering fortifications and refugee-packed population centers alike fall to sudden ravenous attacks from below. And one by one, the prey world's lights go dark. Even should the defenders somehow see off this onslaught from above and below, the surviving warrior organisms simply go to ground in the deep places their foes cannot reach. There they build their strength once again, even as the unsuspecting prey declare a hard-won victory and begin to rebuild. Soon enough, the serpent rises again, and again, and again. High Fleet Kronos Faced with the sudden surge in demonic incursions caused by the Great Rift, the hive mind has been forced to adapt swiftly. High Fleet Kronos is an example of its newly refined strategy for doing battle with ethereal enemies that provide no biomass to replenish that expended in driving them back. The swarms of High Fleet Kraken fight with unusual strategic caution. Their advance is preceded by shadow in the warp vastly more powerful than that manifested by any other High Fleet. While some have observed this phenomena to have a more restricted area of effect than the shadow cast by most high fleets, the trade-off is more than borne out by its impact. Kronos' shadow actively drains the life from psychically capable prey, siphoning their energies to fortify the swarm, leaving them as nothing but crumbling husks. Empiric manifestations falter and fade beneath the suffocating shroud. Eyewitness accounts have even sighted warp rifts shrinking before the Hive Fleet's approach and demonic entities snuffed out like candle flames. Of course, 
All such statements have been suppressed by the Inquisition, for they deal with prescribed war phenomena. Yet the fact of High Fleet Kronos's contra-empiric powers remains. Once its swarms commit to battle, this High Fleet focuses on ranged warfare and commits to close assault only where victory is guaranteed. Its warrior organisms instinctively conserve biomass, while feeder beasts concentrate on recycling all dead tyranid matter as swiftly and efficiently as possible. More than one commander has been wrong-footed, as their well-braced static defenses were blasted methodically apart by salvos of bio-incendiaries, living artillery bombardments and pinpoint hails of chitinous shards. Highfleet Kronos enjoys a symbiotic relationship with the tendrils of Highfleet Leviathan, which have been observed predating but not devouring entire worlds worth of biomass. Following behind the larger fleets, the swarms of Kronos replenish their might from these macabre larders before rejoining the fight against inimical warp incursions. In this way, Kronos's tendrils have slowly worked their way along the fringes of the Great Rift, focusing on chaos-corrupted systems with the potential to threaten the progress of other high fleets. They lash out like the stinger of some monstrous beast before withdrawing to regain their strength. It might be tempting for prey races to believe High Fleet Kronos an unlikely ally in the fight against chaos. Such hopes are soon dashed. Wherever possible, the swarms of Kronos pick off vulnerable prey worlds, consuming biomass with ravenous ferocity to fuel their ongoing fight against their true enemies. Moreover, this High Fleet swarms have been observed targeting psychic prey, be that Asuyani craft worlds, sorcerous heretic cults, or human systems in the grip of mass psychic mutation. Whether this is an attempt to absorb more psycho biomass or to eliminate potential conduits for demonic incursion is unclear. But with the energies of the Great Rift accelerating the psychic potential of almost every race in the galaxy, it is a disturbing and dangerous new precedent. High Fleet Hydra At first glance, High Fleet Hydra presents as amongst the smaller and less perilous of its kind. This impression is only reinforced by its hive ship's seemingly contentment to lurk in the wake of larger swarms and feed on their scraps. It is only when Hydra surges suddenly forward to attack that the illusion is shattered. High Fleet Hydra has only recently arrived in the galaxy by following routes already taken by larger, slower tendrils of other Hive Fleets it has made alarming speed toward the galactic core. In order to maintain the reserves of biomass, Hydra's hive ships scavenge mercilessly, devouring the shattered remnants of splinter fleets and defeated tendrils as readily as more conventional prey species. Its invasion swarms also descend upon planets that have only recently withstood the onslaught of other hive fleets, finishing off those weakened prey worlds and devouring their despairing defenders. Magos xenobiologist Ekros van Zendrek has studied High Fleet Hydra's advance into the galaxy. After first watching from a safe distance as its swarms consume the mining world of Kostok, advanced stealth shrines on the Magos' survey ships have allowed him to trail his monstrous quarry while remaining hidden. Well, thus far at least from the hive ship's senses. Van Zendrick has made and transmitted copious notes on the swift advance of Hydra, extrapolating its unusual tactics from his observations. It is fortunate for the Imperium that this is the case. When the swarms of High Fleet Hydra unleash their true fury, it is rare indeed that any prey survive to recount their experiences. Van Zendrick has established that the hive ships of Hydra retain enormous reserves of biomass. They seem able to deploy it with tremendous speed, awakening or spawning huge swarms in a terrifyingly short span. Moreover, thanks to its rapacious consumption of other Splinter Fleet remnants, High Fleet Hydra appears to have absorbed the sense memories of many defeated predecessors and learned swiftly from them. 
from a compact core. Hydra can thus spawn sudden, enormous invasion swarms and vast masses of defensive void organisms at need, all of which possess instincts honed through the deaths of all those they have predated. High Fleet Hydra's insidious threat response reflex does not end there. During the early stages of planetary invasion, its high ships see the upper atmosphere of the prey world with vast shores of tyrannocytes, within which slumber broods of warrior organisms. When bioforms on the surface meet stiff resistance, they send out pulses through the synaptic network as they die. These signals trigger the floating tyrannocytes, which plunge groundward, bearing their monstrous cargo to the spot where their fellows were slain. Thus, in slaying one brood of warrior organisms, prey soon find themselves facing thrice their number of foes, then countless more again. Soon enough, even the most powerful defenses are overrun by the might of High Fleet Hydra's seemingly endless swarms. High Fleet Tiamat High Fleet Tiamat is heavily adapted for defensive warfare. This alone has been enough to draw puzzled and alarmed scrutiny from many prey races, for the fleet's behavior seems atypical of the usual, never-ending predatory onslaught. The more that groups like humanity's Ordo Xenos or the seers of Craftgod Iandon learn of Tiamat, the deeper grows their dread. Only recently have the prey races of the galaxy begun to suspect the true threat posed by High Fleet Tiamat. At least one faction within the Ordo Xenos has come to believe that Tiamat's vanguard organisms may have been present in the galaxy from as early as Millennium 35, and that, working slowly and stealthily, these tyranids have been laboring to fashion some dreadful bioconstruct ever since. Unlike those of other high fleets, the tendrils of Tiamat have remained concentrated within one region of space. They coil about the Tiamat system that gave their high fleet its imperial designation. Until recently, they seemed almost dormant, content to slither out and snatch away unlucky convoys of merchant craft or overrun worlds possessed of no sentient life. The only time prey species have truly suffered Tiamat's wrath has been when their forces have attempted to investigate or purge the High Fleet swarms. At such times, they have found themselves facing tremendously resilient warrior organisms, whose chitinous armor is diamond hard and whose flesh regrows as rapidly as attackers can wound it. Tiamat swarms fight in overlapping waves, each bulwark capable of soaking up tremendous punishment and bogging down the prey long enough for encircling broods to close about them like a monstrous claw snapping shut. So costly have assaults against High Fleet Tiamat proven that, in a galaxy replete with more active invading threats, they have been infrequent and hard to justify. Only now, as the High Fleet's tendrils multiply and push aggressively outward, does the folly of such inactivity become clear. Tales abound of a gene-stealer cult calling itself the Choir of the Void, whose adherents have arisen on many worlds only to take ship en masse once their uprisings have succeeded. The Choir leave abandoned worlds in their wake, sailing unmolested into the heart of Tiamat territory and bringing great feasts of biomass to their supposed deities. Meanwhile, records resurface of a terrible biostructure upon the world of Xyaphoria in the Tiamat system. As more and more psychers complain of a building psychic scream emanating from that world, those in power begin to ask what fell purpose the Tyranid's biostructure might serve and what nightmare may befall the galaxy should it reach completion. High Fleet Ouroboros The swarms of High Fleet Ouroboros bring death on dark wings. Striking swiftly and in great numbers, their warrior organisms fill the skies of the prey world and descend with piercing shrieks to rend and tear. Imperial xenobiologists and scholars of alien apocrypha have theorized that High Fleet Ouroboros may be the most ancient of its kind. Some point to historical accounts drawn from dust-drowned archives 
and originally penned by Cardinal Miramulus the Elder. Miramulus tells of the legions of Ouroboros, describing a host of winged Xenos horrors, aflame with infernal ague, that descended upon the worlds around the Thracian Primaris. The Cardinal's accounts detail the Xenos stripping all life from the worlds they invaded, while subsequent investigations by inquisitorial teams have noted distinctive bioplasmic scarring upon relics surviving from the war to defeat this rapacious threat. Other savants, more versed in the biologian arts, cite the primitive nature of High Fleet Ouroboros' organisms as an indicator of its antiquity. Organic samples removed from battles against this High Fleet appear almost primordial in their rugged simplicity, especially when compared to the more refined bioforms of High Fleets such as Leviathan or Kronos. Far from being a weakness of High Fleet Ouroboros, however, the horrifying accounts of those who have battled its swarms reveal the simplicity to be a strength. Strategies refined during the Tyrannic Wars prove ineffectual against Ouroboros' warrior organisms. Armies expecting to exploit anatomical weak spots, carefully documented instinctive behaviors or vulnerabilities to tailored gene toxins, discover too late that these tyranids do not possess them. Lessons learnt over centuries of warfare against the Tyranid menace must be hastily discarded in favour of far more basic and bloody-minded defensive tactics. It is a realisation that comes to many prey worlds too late to be of any aid. Even those who do grasp swiftly how to combat High Fleet Ouroboros face a daunting and nightmarish fight for survival. Its invasion swarms favour airborne organisms, filling the prey world skies with teeming billions of gargoyles interspersed with descending spore clouds. Large shapes cut through these living thunderheads, vast aerial monstrosities ploughing through the screeching masses, like deep-sea leviathans scattering shoals of fish. So thick do the flying organisms swarm that they blot out the daylight plummeting to attack in the unnatural twilight cast by their livery wings, the eerie glow that surrounds their bioweapons the only light. Their onslaught comes with shocking speed and, whenever possible, Ouroboros organisms strike at command posts and any prey they identify as being military or spiritual leaders. Masses of chittering, clawing, flapping monsters topple vox masts with their sheer weight wash out auspex screens in a blizzard of amorphous contacts, and pluck messengers screaming into the air to be torn apart. In this way, Ouroboros claws out the eyes of its prey, blinding them strategically on a planetary scale, and punting the defenders into ignorance and panic. Dragged down to the same primitive level as the monsters attacking them from on high, knots of frightened soldiery huddle together for protection. They cower in subterranean bolt holes, staying within the dwindling circle of their light sources and crackling fires, and praying to their deities for salvation. All that comes in answer are fresh waves of tyrannic ground troops and hidden horrors that systematically hunt down every last prey, flushing them out into the surface where, at the last desperate end, the sky swarms descend upon them with exultant shrieks. Only one prey species in the galaxy remains consistently unfazed by High Fleet Ouroboros. Most orcs care little for strategy and would not recognize global coordination if it grew fangs and bit them. As such, green-skinned warbands welcomed the onslaught of the skyborne swarms of High Fleet Ouroboros with the same glee that they would any other good fight. More than happy to fight war on a crude and primitive level, the orcs have defeated Ouroboros swarms on more than one occasion. End quote. The Tyranids have been here for much, much longer than people may wish to believe, but most certainly before the proclaimed First Tyrannic War. In fact, Ouroboros is not the first suspected hive fleet to reach the Milky Way galaxy. Hints are left all over the place, but they are there. For there is Ouroboros, but there are hints to even earlier high fleet incursions into the galaxy. 
Colossus being one of them. I will link a video from the Great Remleys of the Warhammer 40k Theories channel for more details, for he has summed it up so well. But there are monsters hidden in plain sight all over the galaxy, the setting. The Kraken of Fenris, the horrors on Catachan, both flora and fauna, and others all abound. But it is not just in the fleets and their methods of warfare that I must draw your attention. I also feel we should hear what the newest Codex states about psychic powers, the shadow in the warp, and the effect of chaos on the Tyranids. Hence, let us dive back in. To quote, The Shadow in the Warp Settling like a vast and terrible pall across countless worlds, the Shadow in the Warp heralds the coming of the Tyranid Hive Fleets. It is a nightmarish phenomenon that, whether by accident or design, has proved a cripplingly effective weapon against many of the galaxy's sentient races. The Warp is a strange dimension of ever-shifting energies that lies behind the skin of real space. It is a churning and mysterious infinity amidst whose currents the passions, obsessions, sorrows and joys of all living things find reflection. The Warp has been both boon and bane to the galaxy's sentient races. It is a source of near limitless power for those who can harness it. It is the ocean from which flows the gifts of all psychers. It is also the means by which humanity spreads out across the stars, and by which the Imperium of Man achieves interstellar travel and communication to this day. Yet it is also the realm of timeless and malevolent sentiences born from the primal emotions of all living things and hell-bent on consuming reality. It is because of these hostile entities, known as demons, that extreme caution must be exercised when dealing with the warp. However, there is no alternative but to take the risk. Without using the energies of the Sea of Souls, each settled system becomes an isolated candle flame amidst the endless darkness, just waiting to be snuffed. It is this helpless state of isolation that the shadow in the warp imposes upon the Tyranid's prey. The phenomenon itself is a smothering psychic signal that surrounds the high fleets, extending vast distances from them in all directions. Though even races as advanced as the ancient Eldari remain unable to explain how. The shadow inveigles its way into mortal senses and interferes with their connection to the warp. For even the most dull-witted of creatures, this is an unsettling experience and causes heightened anxiety, paranoia and panic to spread through prey populations. A sense of all-pervading dread goads frightened mobs to violence as these doomsayers take to the streets even before the first warnings of the Tyranids' approach are received. It is among psychically attuned beings, however, that the shadow in the warp is felt the worst. Human psychers, orc weird boys, and virtually the entire Eldari race are amongst such unfortunates, their psychic sensitivity rendering them dangerously vulnerable to the shadow's insidious effects. Some have described the phenomenon as a numbing blanket of static that fills their thoughts and makes it even harder to think or speak. To others, it is the chittering and squealing of a billion nameless horrors, the endless scraping of talons across their minds, or the onset of existential dread so acute that it is all they can do to keep breathing beneath its pall. Those attempting to actively employ psychic powers while engulfed by the shadow in the warp are hit hardest of all. Even to access their gifts at such times requires extreme effort, and those who try are likely to be driven mad or slain by explosive cranial hemorrhage as to manifest even the weakest flicker of power. Crucially, Astropaths attempting to send distress calls out to the wider Imperium find their mental cries choked off, more often than not painfully dying before they can force anything out through the smothering psychic blanket. Navigators are equally afflicted, their third eyes are blinded, and their minds overwhelmed by the shadow, so that attempts to guide evacuation craft to safety or warships to the rescue of the beleaguered worlds 
end in disaster and death. It is thanks to the Shadow in the Warp that most Imperial worlds beset by the Tyranids must fight alone, cut off from aid and unable to even scream. Nor are humans the only victims of this phenomenon. For most branches of the Eldari race, merely being in proximity to the Tyranids brings torment that they must struggle to ignore if they are to even stand a chance to fight back. Moreover, the precognitive psychic gifts upon which their dwindling race relies are all but useless once the shadow in the warp settles about them. Warp sorcery falters as easily as more sanctified psychic powers, leaving even the servants of the Dark Gods howling in powerless fury as the Tyranids descend on them. Only truly psychically inactive races, such as Tau or Necrons, have less to fear from the Shadow. But even then, the insidious hive mind has methods by which it can weaponize its gestalt will against them to claim victory. It is unclear precisely how Tyranid war beasts manifest powers that echo the psychic abilities of the varied races they prey upon. Yet the longer the hive fleets drive their tendrils into the galaxy, and the more of their swarms that emerge from the outer darkness of the void, the more Tyranids have been observed adapting ever more bioforms whose abilities do just that. Some Xenobiologians postulate that these creatures are siphoning warp energy in a controlled manner, wholly removed from anything achieved by any other known life form. Others believe it is the synaptic energies of the hive mind itself that are being channeled, crackling through the encephalatic synapse tissues of the Tyranids before unleashing in hissing blasts of lethal energies, projected as shimmering force fields amplified into sanity-shredding psychic screams or employed to drive lesser swarm beasts into frenzied killing fury. For those facing the Tyranids, such academic theorizing rings hollow. It matters only that the Tyranids are able to employ a ghastly range of apparently psychic abilities to tear apart the minds and bodies of their prey, seemingly with ease. Inexplicable Phenomena the longer the scholars of the galaxy study the Tyranid menace, the more bewildered they become by the Xenos's weird interactions with the warp. In some ways, the Tyranids appear empirically inert. The Ordo Xenos have pieced together records that show splinter fleets swallowed by warp rents, only to emerge from other immaterial phenomena in entirely different regions of the galaxy. Should most races' craft be plunged through the warp like this, they would likely emerge badly damaged or mutated, if they emerged at all. The hive ships appear unharmed by their experience, surging from the roiling tides of warp space as hungry and as deadly as ever. Worse, more than one such tendril has burst forth directly into the midst of a settled system. The Inquisitors of the Ordo Xenos and the Elite Death Guard have also discovered another insidious phenomenon in the last few centuries. Gene stealers are amongst the most prolific of the High Fleet's vanguard organisms, moving ahead of the swarms as stowaways aboard Imperial vessels and infiltrating human worlds. Only since the horrors of Gosar Quintus has it become apparent that these creatures are doing more than hunting. It is in the gene stealer's gift to infect abducted prey organisms with a gene curse that brings the victims under the gene stealer's sway. More and more of the prey population are forcibly inducted or born into the resultant gene stealer cult, which festers beneath the skin of imperial civilization until the day it erupts in full blown rebellion. Although this were not threat enough, it has also been suggested that the cults themselves broadcast some manner of mass psychic signal, though it is beyond even the most talented magi to decipher its exact nature or mechanism. What seems apparent is that the Hive fleets can perceive this subtle beacon and follow it to fresh feeding grounds. Such an unholy fusion of human and tyranid psychic and synaptic potential hints at ominous and terrible nightmares yet to come. End quote. And so, 
we start to see it all coming together. For now we have a much clearer picture, still so vague, so ephemeral. For who can know the mind of the hive? Well, if you take him off his pedestal, or bring him out of the gutters of being seen as an unthinking foe, then things become much clearer. The Tyranids have come before, and they have been defeated, and they have been ignored. Whatever the Tyranids are, they have reacted like a strategist, not an all-consuming moor. For they have sent in their scouts, not only as the High Fleet Ouroboros, or even Colossus, but even earlier, with gene stealers and zotes before them. They have evolved, is what some might say, but others might see the sentience. For they have then devised differing armies, different formations, and differing approaches to war. They have developed heroes of a kind, Death Leaper, Old One Eye, all the way up to the Swarm Lord. They have fleets that hit hard, armies that burrow, fleets that change often, old fleets that throw a spanner in the works of all predictions. They have fleets that defend regions, they have high fleets that attack from the galactic edge, and those who strike from under its plane. They even have a sweeper hive in reserve that consumes lesser tendrils, hoarding their biomass ready to be used again, much like an officer going into a scrub of a region where a battle has been fought and lost, then rallying the resources that might have been shattered from the army, by desertion being cut off, or simply by being lost. The Tyranids are able to travel through the warp without harm, able to adopt and absorb new psychic strains and counter them. This does not sound like an accident, evolution or happenstance. This all smacks of being so well... planned. For evolution would require their fleets to start almost identically and change due to the adversities and resistances they faced. But this is not so. The hive mind is testing which tactics, which strategies and which abilities will be most effective. The Silent King has come back. But to state that he would consider his people at risk from just an avalanche of flesh is obtuse. It does not fit into the Necron's grand vision of themselves, let alone the Silent King, slayer of not only the Old Ones, but also the Catan. He destroyed not only the gods that were his enemies, but also the gods that allowed him victory over them. He is a planner, a plotter, with patience enough to wait millions of years for a scheme to mature. Yet we are to believe that he just had a look at the size of the Tyranid fleets and turned around, attempting to get his people to form a resistance before they arrived? <laughs> Nay. I, for one, do not believe it. I think that this, the most cunning, methodical, and patient of all of the heads of state, would make absolutely certain of the threat before he returned, before he changed his course. And that means he does indeed know how much of a threat they are, for his ships do not attack the Orcs nor the Eldar, his enemies of old. Supposedly, the very races he fled through time to avoid their heyday. If he were a butcher, bitter and twisted, then surely he would have stuck around and then watched as his waking people smashed the Crook and Eldar. No, his fleets do not attack either of these races. They fight the Tyranids. He has even forged short-term alliances of convenience with the Imperium of Mankind, as long as the enemy was the Tyranid again. A confusing meeting with the Chapter Master and the subsequently now made regent of half of the Imperium, Dante, was his short-term conspirator. For the Silent King sees his true enemy as the Great Devourer, the Tyranids. And he is right to do so, for when we draw it all together, the Tyranids are the true threat. Perhaps they not merely consume all. Perhaps they will make this a galaxy of their domain. Will the proliferation of psychers after the psychic awakening make matters even worse? Fleet Kronos seems to be doing something, or to be up to something in this regard. Why? Fighting chaos? 
or merely increasing their psi powers against the humans, Eldar, and Orcs, who are known to be powerful in this regard. Is the new construct of High Fleet Tiamat a beacon to draw in more High Fleets, or something altogether more insidious and thus dangerous to the galaxy? Are the movements of the High Fleets far more preordained and organized than anyone previously thought? Are they attacking hives of the Tyranids, veiling a more serious threat? That they are not mere bugs. Not insects that see the galaxy as an all-you-can-eat buffet before moving on to the next one. What if they are actually a highly advanced civilization, with a plan on a scale that would make the Silent King shudder in its patience, creativity and subtlety? For if the thing on Xyophora is not a beacon, if they have actually been able to mostly self-sustain and not merely put most of their armies into torpor until they are threatened, this would change the entire situation with the Tyranids. And it would mean that Tiamat is not just another high fleet, but a sign of the actual civilization that they may be bringing to this galaxy. <laughs> Although, of course, this civilization is not very civil. Are they taking great advantage of their appearance and seeming modus operandi to gain the advantage? Because an animal or bug can be terrifying, but is always undervalued. Its threat diminished as a defender somehow believes that they are better. Hence, they will not possibly lose to such base creatures. And if this seems like a leap too far, for who would understand the horrors of the Tyranids? Well, simply put, this is happening all of the time. From the Cryptoman event, which is still seen by many an Inquisitor and those high in the Adeptus Terror, as an utter overreaction and a mistake, whereas it may be the only way to truly combat them. But if High Fleet Tiamat is anything to go by, the Tyranids are not here to merely consume all and move on. No. They may be here for the duration. And the smug refusal to take them seriously has not been purely a human taint or trait. For the Orcs not worried by the Tyranids, in fact, they like the Tyranids coming to them for a scrap. But in the Eldar is also this strain of madness. As is so oft the case with the sons of Eldenesh, the Eldar are too haughty, is what most believe. And the tragic annihilation of most of Iandon is just the tip of the iceberg. For the Eldar could not fathom that something as simple, as base, as ugly and ungainly as the bugs could ever threaten them. Yet the most powerful of all of their craft worlds, Iandon, was brought low. It was near capsized and consumed by the bugs. Aspect warriors and elites from other craft worlds arrived and yet, even then, they only barely survived, if you can call it that. When Prince Iriel brought back his fleets to save them, even so, the damage was done. And the grandest craft world and greatest congregation of all Eldar outside of the Dark City was slaughtered so convincingly that they may never recover. A ghost ship with ghost warriors walking dark and empty corridors for all eternity. To sum up, the Tyranids do not act like a hive. They act like a well-oiled, superbly planned and amazingly led invasion force. They can match and dispatch the Eldar, Necrons and all others. They are appearing in vast multitudes, yet these initial thrusts could be merely a vanguard to a far more multitudinous force. So, what are the Tyranids up to? I personally believe they are not here to consume the galaxy and move on. I believe their faculties, and thus their ultimate goals, are far more nuanced than any dare to believe. Thank you for your precious time. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Tulu.